keep finding it down 30, 40, 50 feet, 60 feet, 100 feet, because um, sometimes, it, sometimes it's down 80, 90, 100 feet. Depends on the thermocline. Now, on Lake Erie, you know, where it's, it's much shallower. Um, but you go on to Lake Huron or Lake Michigan or Lake Ontario, Lake Superior, you know, that thermocline or that, new, not just the thermocline, but the nutrient-rich water. Because, you know, that thermocline, you've got the two different levels of water. You've got the warm water on top and the cooler water on the bottom, right? Well, yeah. That's, everyone, you know, when you're fishing on deeper water, the, the fish are on that thermocline. But what's actually on that thermocline? What's keeping those fish there? What's, what's, making, what's making those fish want to be there? What's making the fish's food want to be there? Right. You know, there's there's a whole chain of events of why things are there and why they're not there. Exactly. And and everything's looking for one thing. I mean, they're all looking for the same thing we're looking for, which is that green water, because everything knows that's where the food chain's hanging out. Right? Yeah. So. Nutrients, you know, where does the food chain start? Where where's green water? What's green water? What's uh you know where does it start you know we can see it in certain places but yeah. where where is it in deeper water or where is it at in lake ontario and lake michigan and lake huron you know where i remember fishing the tournament and um it was it was a spring tournament and um we were fishing out of port Duluth with salmon but we literally took our boat and ran from from where the water came out of Port Dalhousie, out of that channel, and um, and we just followed the green water up, and we stayed on fish as long as we stayed there. However, again, anybody can see that green water, and then you get a lot of boat traffic on there. But I don't know about you, but I don't really like fishing with a whole bunch of boat traffic. <laughs> you know, the less boat traffic for me, the better. Oh, for sure. I know in the fall, we over here in Grand River when we run steelhead trips. We'll end up trolling right outside the harbor mouth and you can definitely see you know there's a color change there but if the water had, we haven't gotten a lot of rain and the water's clean and whatnot there's a distinct temperature and you know you get a green that green water you can see the, the algae and stuff in it and those right. fish sit in there and they stay in there 100 and when I you get out of it they're not there and when you get in it it's immediate action yeah yeah, you know, when I was 14, the first time I won, I won it because I found the green water. And back then, like we're talking 44 years ago, back then, people were looking for that, you know. But yeah, well, that's where all the big fish were. Well, in the spring, I know over here in Lake Erie, especially our, you know, Cleveland East to Grand River area, you know, where we're, we primarily fish, it's, you can see where that water, when it's that, like pea soup or pea green water, those fish are in and along on the rocks. But when that water goes gin clear and we got a big northeast blow and all that changes and it stays clear, those fish are never there. Right. Now, one thing that I want to tell everyone is you, you want to stay tuned on, on what we're doing this podcast because we're about to share with you how to find green water down 30, 40, 50, 100 feet that you can't visibly see. And I can guarantee you, you find the green water and you find the fish. Wouldn't you agree with that, Captain Dave? Yes, I agree with that. The um, To be able to, you know, if there's nutrient-rich water, but it's not green, right. you know, we don't have green water on the surface. How do we find it? Right. Well, you know, everyone knows that I've got a background in sonar, that I have a sonar patent that I developed, you know, back in 2008. And um, so I pay a lot of attention to those things because when we were developing sonar, we one of the greatest things that um, that bounces the, the signal back, the sound wave back, is air bubbles. And and the other thing is nutrients. They bounce a lot back. When you have bioactivity, it's creating air or carbon dioxide or or oxygen, but it's creating that that um, bubble in the water. And those things are bouncing back and back. The key to learning about where the green water is down 30, 40, 50 feet. 
I know I've been paying attention over the years of watching when you when you're marking a lot of fish, especially when it's real, you know, late summer, our walleye fishings were out in 70 plus foot of water, they're down 40, 50 feet sitting on a thermocline. There's a very strong, looks like interference almost above and below. And you can see the thermocline. But when you start to get out of the fish, your screen, that that sonar screen starts to clean up. Right. And you know, I mean, all of a sudden you got a real you know, it's, you've got a white background. All of a sudden, you have a white white screen with nothing in it—a blank screen, a clean yeah. screen. You know, back when back in the day when we used to use the uh, the um, paper with a paper sonar. <laughs> you know, that's exactly paper. what would happen. you would see. You would either turn up your gain or down. Now, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll turn their gain down so they don't see all the dots because they want to see the fish, but. When you turn the game down, what you're actually doing is you're removing the ability to see the green water. The yeah, nutrients in the water, they're missing. The nutrients in the water are bouncing back, and the, and the small crustaceans and things that are feeding there um, are also bouncing that back, and it looks like all those little dots we're talking about. I would say, though, as a user of electronics and teaching people how to use them, too, you also don't want to be sitting at the marina in five foot of water yeah. and adjust your sensitivity so high that all you see is interference now, not actually material in the water. It's true. But on the other side, what you want to do is adjust your screen so that so that you're getting you. You want to see what we call interference. You want to see those little dots on your screen. And when we come to the fish what we start to see is those number of dots increase and it looks like the interference is increasing on our screen. And when you see that interference in increasing, that's the nutrient rich water you're coming into. And the amazing thing is, is you can find that water at high speed or at low speed. And oftentimes I'll go out, I'll look for a patch of nutrient rich water going 30 miles an hour and I'll find it, I'll mark a waypoint there and I'll go find another one about a mile or two away, and I'll mark that one as well. And then I've got a trolling path, and I could have nobody around me for miles and have it all to myself. And, and I know as soon as that screen starts to change and you start to see that interference, it's like, guys, get ready because those rods are about to fire. What's the, you know, like when we were talking about last week with the different frequencies of sonar, you know, when you're under power using that 200 hertz, and you can actually mark your thermal climbs when you're running. Absolutely. There's, there's times when we're running offshore 15, 17 or more miles where as we're running, you're not marking anything, you're not marking anything. And all of a sudden thermal clearing shows up. You're starting to get that that interference line right, right, or you, know, you, you get it right across the bottom of the screen. And then it starts coming up higher and higher and you get more and more. And then you slow down, take a look at it and then switch to the 50 hertz. Right. And you get all that clutter, all the marks, everything shows up. Yeah, and you know what? We want that clutter. That clutter is the green water. And um, and you know what? It happens every time. We go out there and, and you know we're very successful out on the lake. And it's because we're looking for certain things to find the fish, right? We want to find the fish. If we can't find the fish, then we're not going to be able to catch the fish. I mean, it's more or less just follow the food chain. Where's the, where's the, what's the bait want to eat? Then what, what's eating the bait? Find the green water. So yeah, find the clutter basically. And you found the green water. And, yep. the, and you know, you can also see your thermocline. Sometimes it starts to get, it's really thin and then it starts to get thicker. And, and that's also telling you that there's a lot of activity there going on. And that's because you're in the green water area. So I would say anybody listening, listening and watching tonight, your one way to say test this theory of what we're talking about, if you're not, you know, if you haven't paid attention to this or something that you haven't been with your electronics is come this spring when you get out on the water, if you're near shore and that water is green and it looks nutrient rich, take a look at your sonar and then kind of make a mental note. And then when you get back out on the water again, and you're in you know middle of summer and the water's gin clear and you know water's gotten hot without without the algae mm -hmm. then take another mental note and take a look and see what you have you might you'll see a flat white screen to be clean 
you know, in the springtime, when you've got that runoff, there's always a, it could be a mud line or whatever, right? And you can see on one side it's clear and one side it's, um, it's full of nutrients. And exactly like you said, look through your sonar so you get used to what to look for. Because... Steve, we got a question here, Matt. Uh, Steve Conley asked, do you have any sc uh, screen examples to show? At the moment, no, just because of everything still being wrapped up like a present from wintertime. But we will we will have things, and as this progresses, I will uh, we'll do some of this stuff out on the boat, um, in the marinas. You know, we'll be live with with actual you know sonar and put it put it to use here, not just you know in our living room. Yeah, I can definitely tell you what it looks like. I mean, as you're going out, I don't we don't like to, like Dave said we don't we don't have any screenshots with us right now, but but we'll take some. But as you're going out. You start to see the clutter start slowly and then it gets greater and greater and all of a sudden there's clutter everywhere and when you get into that situation you are now in the middle of that green water it's very you can see it the the thing that a lot of people do is a lot of people will turn down their sonar so they just see the marks of the fish and really we want to see the clutter that's that's key they're usually like i set my sensitivity to the point where I start getting the, I have the marks of the fish and that the clutter starts to show, but it doesn't overwhelm the screen. You can still read between the lines. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you last year at towards the end of the season here, we went out and, um, I, you know, we didn't go out until 1030 in the morning. We didn't launch until 1030 in the morning and, um, people coming back in were like, they were saying to us, why are you going out? The fish are gone. Why, like, why, why even bother? Everybody's coming back in. Nobody's getting anything. And I said, well, we're going to go out and take a look anyway. We went on high speed and we searched around and searched around. We finally found the green water. And that was our best day as far as quality fish of the whole year. We didn't get a walleye under four pounds in there. They were all beautiful fish and full of steelhead and everything. So, Well, man, that's, uh, over the years, fishing out of Fairport Harbor, there's you know, there's a lot of times guys just don't want to run way offshore, burn the fuel, whatever it may be. Yeah. And there's a lot of tools that you could use, you know, um, satellite images for the water temps, the surface temps. And that green water tends to be where there's a big temperature change. You get your thermal climbs that, you know, the, the um, temperature changes are going to put that, you know, that, that plankton and different micro, you know, different food, food chains are going to go to where, Things want to be, we want to live. Hundred percent. And you know what? With the price of fuel now, we don't want to waste time out there. We just want to go out. We want to find that green water and fish those fish. You know, instead of just trolling around, not seeing anything. You know, the other thing too is why is there? That's one of the things why guys are always say, why is there fish here? Why isn't there fish over there? Exactly. And it travels in pockets. You know, when you're out in the lake. It's not like as if you're going to, you'll, you'll hit a pocket of green water and then you'll hit another pocket. And one thing that we found is if you can find um, areas in the water where the contours are coming out into pumps, you know, or into points, oftentimes the green water will collect along those, the sides of those. Oftentimes you'll find a lot of green water there. But I would say like walleye fishing in shallow water, you have, you know, the windy side is always the side that, you know, the fish are on. Well, that's the side that's disturbed and there's clutter in the water and there's, there's the, the start of the food chains is there. And, right. not, you know, they're trying to eat the minnows that are, that are now eating everything else. Yeah. And it's focusing that green water. It's focusing that nutrient rich water. That's, that's what happens. The wind blows. Tip, one tip like I get back to. So our, my Harbor and Fairport Harbor is especially the Cleveland East down to say the PA line and maybe even farther, our shoreline in the spring, you will get green water. It'll go clean. You know, we know that a Northeast blow is going to blow cold water in and it rolls that green, warm, nutrient rich water out. And it takes certain conditions to move those fish in and out of that water. And when that water, when we pull out of the Harbor and it's gin clear, I don't even stop. I just keep on driving north till I find that water that moved offshore. Yeah, there's no point. Exactly. Sometimes though, yeah. you know what'll happen is is you'll get um, 
that wind will blow all that warm, nutrient-rich water out. And then you get some days and you might get some rain and it'll start warming up that water by the shore and and, and you get now a pocket of nutrient-rich water close to shore and, and one offshore. Well, that's like the spring fishing, you'll have that, you'll have that cold water will move in and then it's not nutrient rich because it's not cold or it's not warm enough. Right, exactly. And then as it warms up, that process of the food chain starts and then it, you know, that fish is there, those fish will all move in. And then, but what'll happen is you get another cold blow again, like our Northeast winds that shove it up, shove cold water in. And then those fish follow that warm water right back out. So it's yeah, finding that, green water, nutrient rich. This, this is a big thing in shallow water. It's easier to see because exactly. now, you know, it's top to bottom, Absolutely. but out in deep water is where our, this is our electronics is what's going to help you find it. hundred percent. Yeah. Out in the deep water. That's exactly right. Out in the deep so water. If anybody can take anything away from tonight, it's one of the things is, learn what you're looking at on your screen when you're in shallow water and you can see the green water and see your fish finder and then later in the summer remember that what that looks like out deeper 100 percent, i totally agree with you hey you know um i wanted to before we forget every week we um we do uh, i guess a question and um so this week's question is going to be about the video that was posted. I hope everyone watched it. It showed um, the um, breaking strength of different wire line. And just so everyone knows, this year we have not increased our wire line price. Ours is still at $36.99. And um, other companies have increased theirs to $49.99. But um, this, this week the, um, for the prize, the question is, which company's line was the strongest and what was the breaking strength? So it, it, I think it was, it's, we don't actually put who the companies are for the wire. We just cover it up, but it's like one, two, three, four, five. So whose was the strongest and what was the breaking strength? And I can't see the answers. So Dave, you'll have to, uh, yeah, I'll have to see, see who answers here. I know um, Pat mentioned here, he said he's has had that happen here in the Western basin of Lake Erie. Um, and when the screen gets really cluttered, we usually just uh, can't get rods all set. And that's, you're on the fish, you're on everything. You, you, you don't necessarily have to mark the fish to, to catch them. Absolutely. Especially in the Western end. Yeah. You got some answers here, 34.6, 36. There's Martin. I think that's correct. 36.11 pounds. Yeah. And REM will verify to make sure who got it first. So that's, that's great. Good job, Martin. Uh, yeah. Like, like I think most people, now that we've told them, you know, that the clutter equals green water, and as you see that increase, I think a lot of people are going to have those aha moments, you know, those, hey, you know what? I remember that. Because, For sure. This and certainly pay attention to it because, you know, you don't have to fish where everyone else is. Our Great Lakes are like one giant river system with lots of back eddies and everything where the currents are swirling, it, it, it pushes the nutrients all over the place. You can find your own pocket of nutrient rich water and fish your own fish. You don't have to be with a whole bunch of other people. Most of the time, pardon? I think we got, we need a, uh, we got Martin winning twice and Ariana's messaging. Can we ask another, can we ask one more question? Oh, because Martin won twice. <laughs> Well, Martin winning everything. That's a, you know what? We'll have to figure out one. We'll figure. Well, let's keep going, and then we'll figure out. Um, okay. Well, let's. Okay. Well, here's the question. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll ask the question because it's, and Martin, don't answer. <laughs> um, so the question is, at what age did I win my first tournament? And uh, we'll see what comes up. I don't even think I know that one, Matt. <laughs> I did say it earlier. Earlier in the program, I did say what age I was. So I got Steven at 14. Yep. And he's right. I was 14 years old when hey, I won. You know, the funny thing is, is I won that tournament and nobody there could catch big fish. 
So I ended up starting to take people out fishing and um, they would just, you know, I would, all I wanted was gas money. I just wanted to fish, you know, but just give me gas money and I'll take you out and show you where the fish are and we'll go catch a fish. And every day while we're on vacation, I was taking people out. <laughs> 14 years ago, back 40, 40. Just a couple of years ago, right? 44 years ago, yeah. <laughs> just a few years back. But, Man, I know one thing you mentioned where we got onto the questions is about like currents and yeah. the, the what happens and how things get moved around. Um, this green water type, I mean, and not necessarily green, you would, I would have, to, you know, you say maybe not even a color to it, but nutrient rich water that's typically green when we see it to the eye when we're, you know, fishing in shallow. Right. Is how the currents move this stuff around. So, out of Fairport, Ashtabula, Erie, PA, you know, you get into the areas that we are highly, highly, you know, current dependent. These, these fish move around, they're in the current, out of currents, sometimes it's big directional changes. Um, you know, we get a big blow, okay, where'd the fish go? Where, where are they? And that's, you know, you get in this cat and mouse hunting game and able to make high speed runs and search for fish and kind of have an idea what you're looking at saves us a lot of time on the water with customers. Absolutely. Well, last week we talked about high speed runs. And before I continue, hey, like and share this video, guys. If you're in fishing groups or whatever, like and share it so that uh, that other people can have a chance. Oh, and by the way, if you do, you enter the spin the wheel. And this week's winner was Martin Tucson. He used to spin the wheel, win the wheel for this week. But if you like and share it, then you, then you can join in. Um, You'll, you'll, uh, you can also win prizes like this hat or, or other prizes that we give away. What were we talking about there? I, I'm getting old. <laughs> well, I know, Matt. I know later, you know, as the season progresses and fishing, and we can do some of these videos down at the boat and show live, and I can record some stuff, um, right. is showing, how, like, actually, I can record some of the videos from fishing during the day, and then there are throughout the week, and then actually explain you know like our your, your wire line how do we use the wire line how do we put baits in the zone with that how to you know where are we putting them and why are we putting them there yeah 100 percent. we'll definitely get into that maybe the next time and and how to start to once we find the fish how to target those fish but i was talking before i talked about the spin the wheel what i was mentioning was last week we talked about the use of 200 and, and kilohertz when we're on the run Yep. So we're running, we're using the 200 kilohertz. What the 200 kilohertz does is it shows you the fish, the fish marks that, that we explained last time, but it also shows you um, the nutrient-rich water, the green water. So it, it's really helpful for both of those. And now this week, we've explored how to find the green water using your sonar. And every week, we're going to go deeper and deeper into how to find the fish because what we really want is we want you to be able to go on the lake, not have to ask anybody at the dock where the fish are or any questions, just know how to find the fish. The, uh, yeah, who's, yeah, are you chasing fish or are you chasing boats? Yeah, 100%. I don't Matt, think you, boats. There's someone here, Kenny's asked a question. Uh, there's, uh, looking, he's looking for some wire. And he wants who's carrying it at the Grand Rapids show. You know what he, he's looking for wire and who is who would be carrying it at the Grand Rapids sports show? Oh boy. Um at the Grand Rapids, you might be able to get it at um at Frank's Great Outdoors. I'm not sure who's um Russell's gonna be there with his store and I'm not sure if he'll have it or not. But um there should be a few stores that have it, obviously. Okay, are you looking for the night? I believe nineteen strand. Yeah, what I would do if I was him is call the store and ask them to bring some for him, and that, and and the stores at the show will definitely do that. If he calls Frank's Great Outdoors, for example, and asks them to bring some nineteen strand to the show that he's going to buy it, you know, they'll bring it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the 19 strand is one of my favorite summertime deep water go-to yeah. lines. Yeah, I know. It's we'll, we'll cover a lot of that later this summer. 
Yeah, we certainly will. I mean, when people see how you utilize it and all your depth charts for it as well, I think they're going to be um, wanting to, to do the same program as you do. Well, it's fine tuning and having all the dive curves for the baits and how to use it to target the fish in that um, in that clutter and the you know it's not necessarily always putting them down on the bait on the fish it's just putting them down where they're eating yeah especially down in that 40 50 foot range you know now on, on my boat i use wire quite i mean primarily we use wire and we use braid um the only time we'll we'll leave the braid is when the fleas are bad and then we'll just run wire on every single rod every. yeah because i just don't want to deal with the fleas it's just not not fine. Kenny said here, he said he saw the strength test last week um, and it's very supple as well. And it, it is, Kenny, you're going to have to hold off on this week on getting in the wire. But um, I know at some time, at some point in time, I know Matt and I've talked, we'll do a very in depth use and process of running 19 strand targeting walleye with, with body baits and so forth. That's going to be on the boat type thing, not in, not in my living room. Yeah, you know, folks, if you have any questions, keep keep asking them. And then next next time we're on, which is in about four weeks or so, uh, we'll we'll answer your questions and we'll go through the next step on how how to find the fish, which is a key. We're into about forty minutes now, Dave, which is probably longer than we wanted. But you know, sometimes it um, the the podcast takes you further than you. Oh, yeah. Intended, right? Well, I know I want to definitely want to. You know, anybody that's got questions about the sonar, how to use its sensitivity, I know, I know we're definitely going to use a live, you know, on the boats, powered up screens to look at. Um, I was hoping to do something this week, but it just didn't work out. Right. Um, but we'll definitely power screen up, show what we're looking at, get it into a demo mode, put it live at the marina, and so forth. Well, Dave, I mean, you you install so many sonar units on boats. I mean, if anybody on our next podcast has a question on that, how, where the transducer should be, how do you, how do you know the location of where it should be and setting up your whole sonar? Maybe we could probably do a, a podcast just on that. Yeah, I know I'm in the middle of an install right now for a friend of mine, um, Edgar's boat. We're putting in a whole Simrad system, radar, multiple screens, new sonar, um, new transducer, everything. So, um, you know, maybe I can maybe I can get some pictures and tutorial of what we're doing and why we're doing it with that. Yeah, hundred percent. I think people would appreciate that. You know, so, I yeah, think there's a uh, Stephen says, do you run transom mount or through haul transducers on your boat? Um, Stephen, it's kind of both. Um, usually, it's the boat size dependent and what kind of transducer. You know, a lot of like say rangers, those walleye tournament boats, they're more transom mount. Not all, but most. Uh, where for me, and it's a do a lot to access and what kind of where where you're using them. For me, ninety percent of my boats or ninety percent of the stuff is all through haul. We drill the hole, mount it through. So I wouldn't say one's better than the other. Just the the through haul has more more options and. Um, what do you want to say more? You can get into higher powerful, more expensive options than the transoms. Right. And you have to know what you're doing when you put your transducer. I mean, this is a whole, you know, what, let's a whole say, other thing spent about two hours on this. We could be, yeah, we could be two hours talking here. <laughs> uh, Tina, we got Garmin or Hummingbird Captain. Um, I mean, to be honest, that's, I'm a Simrad dealer. We deal with a lot of uh, Navico products, so Simrad uh, and uh, Lawrence. But um, pretty much everybody's making a great product anymore. Um, yeah. there, there's no, you really can't go wrong. The technology is good with everybody. It's just kind of what user interface you want to, you're comfortable with. Yeah, definitely. And the Simrad stuff, I, I put a Simrad on my boat this last year, and I'll tell you, I used to of, um, you know, the Lawrence HPS units and going to, the, I think it's the UV03, um, but going to that from the old one is night and day what you see on your screen. It's, the technology is amazing. Now. 
So you got like, like Kenny asked, do you find integration issues mixing brands? Kenny, not really. It depends on, you don't want to have two 200 Hertz transducers running at the same time. You're going to get some interference with each other. But you know, if you got a, if you've got an old, you know, hummingbird chart and you're using a Lorance fish finder, you're not going to have any issues. Um, but you're just, you're going to run into things where you're not going to be able to integrate them together. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so really. Anybody, anybody got any questions with their sonar, like in adjustments or, or even post up any comments after this even goes after we're off the live side of this, if there's questions, we can bring them up next, you know, the next time we're on. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should cover more of that. Let's go into that more next time, Dave. And you know, Let me, I'll see if I can get some pictures of some of the projects I'm in and then the, that I'm installing and explain. I mean, a lot of the hardest part, just fishing all the wires is point A to point B. That's typically the problem. But, right. um, you know, like putting a transducer and a through haul on a boat is the problem we have is access. You know, sometimes the good access spots are not the good locations and the right. good locations have no access. So yeah. sometimes you have a you're you, you're kind of at the mercy of what your boat and how it's built exactly 100 percent. well i think uh, you know dave like i said our, we can talk for two hours <laughs> or we, yeah. we really shouldn't we got too long yeah and next time we'll talk a lot more about it because i think it's important um everything our show the one that dave and i what we're trying to do is those that watch our show we want you to be able to go on the lake and find the fish. And then once once we've taught you that, once you're comfortable going out without asking anybody, we want you to get to the point where you don't have to ask anyone where are the fish or what colors are they using or whatever. We're going to teach you all that. So when you go on the lake, you just go. You don't look for anyone. You don't talk to anyone. You just go and you figure out the program, which it's a lot more fun, actually, for me now, figuring out you know, where the fish are and what will make them go the best. I mean, that's the exciting part to me. Actually reeling them in, I'll let all my crew, they can reel the fish in. The, the biggest thing is, I always say, is if you've got, if you have everybody's leaving the harbor and everybody's going to the right, but there's that one guy going to the left, that's the one you want to pay attention to. For sure. And that's usually the person that's on the fish, that's on something that nobody else is, and why are they there? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, like, like I said, Dave, those that are following you and I and follow us every time we're on, uh, we're going to teach you guys what we know how to find the fish. And I think we're both pretty successful at, at finding the fish and, and not only just finding fish, but finding big fish as well. You know, you can also find, and this is a whole other podcast on how to find the larger fish over the smaller fish but um just stay tuned every time we're on here and we'd like it so that when the summer comes when you start fishing that um that you know what you're performing everyone else if, if that happens i think dave and i will be pretty happy we've we've accomplished what we came to accomplish then yeah but basically that's what we're, we'd like to do is all the tools that everybody has on their boat to catch fish how do we maximize the potential of all of our tools Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Dave, you know what? Right. I think uh, we'll say adios to everyone and uh, thanks for joining us. And um, we'll see you back here in about four weeks. Uh, look for us. Our, our title is always going to be how to find the fish. Put your questions in guys. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff we can cover and if there's anything specific, put it in and we'll try to get to it next week. Okay. Perfect. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. Take care. You have the